This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Welcome, guys, to Somewhere in the Skies, and we have a very, very special guest joining us today on the show. Um, for any of you who watch The Late Late Show in the United States or uh, possibly Comedy Bang Bang, one of my favorite shows as well, um, you will know him. He is a musician, a vocalist, a beatboxer, an improviser, um, but you might also know him from the UFO world. You'll know him as the person who asked two former U.S. presidents about UFOs. Literally a dream for any of us in this UFO world. And he actually did it. So we're going to talk all about those interviews with two former U.S. presidents, his thoughts and theories on UFOs, aliens, and all that stuff, and about his music as well. So let's not waste any more time. I'm going to bring him in right now. Here he is, guys. Reggie Watts, welcome to Somewhere in the Skies. (laughs) <laughs> it's just good to be back. <laughs> just kidding. Um, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course, man. But I love that. I love that. That was very <laughs> ominous. What a way to start a UFO podcast. Um, hey, well, let's not really, um, I guess, you know, waste any time. I want to know, first and foremost, um, before we even get to these interviews you did with uh, Obama and with Clinton, um, what got you interested in UFOs? What made you ask those questions on television? Um, do you have kind of a story about what got you into this topic or what made you curious about asking about UFOs? Yeah, give us the origin story if you don't mind on that. Well, I mean, with Obama, he was on and uh, it was during the period right after the Pentagon released uh, all the footage from the Navy uh, it was just all Navy footage, but um, all that with the Tic Tac and the Go Fast and all that stuff. So they just released all that. And uh, he was on the show, you know, obviously not in the building, but on, on, on the screen. And I asked him, I, I well, I had I had a feeling about asking about uh, extraterrestrials for sure. But then, like, I think the guy who takes care of our band, the guy who kind of, like, gets stuff for our band or whatever, Morgan Bender, he... Uh, he was like, oh, you should ask him about UFOs or whatever. But I was kind of like bummed because I was like, I was already going to ask him and I didn't want someone to be like, oh, I took credit for asking for that. You know, whatever. It's fine. Right. Um, but uh, I was going to ask him anyways. And so when it came time, uh, I just kind of was like, oh, you know, how about them aliens or whatever? <laughs> and uh, and I was just genuinely interested. It was kind of a lighthearted question. Uh, I wasn't expecting him to, to answer uh sincerely uh, in the way that he does right. because i guess obama had never answered that question before so that was kind of an interesting uh moment i didn't think about that at all i was just like oh, i'm gonna ask him this question i expect him probably to be shifty and you know whatever like how politicians do it but he just answered straight up i love that he was just you know and i was like sick <laughs> so that was <laughs> that was uh that was a great response and then i didn't expect it to get as big of a Reaction online, obviously, people, the UFO community or the UAP community, um, it obviously, is like lived in the shadows and is like a weird borderline community because there's, like a, there's a whole spectrum of people involved in this community, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, there are diehard people, there are people with personal experiences, there are people uh, who haven't had personal experiences but like really dig really deep into rabbit holes and things like that. And, um, and if, but in total, that community tends to be marginalized. And so I had, so the reaction made sense in hindsight, like that it would be so big, like, look what, look what this guy, he asked him, look what, what, you know, and, and because for me, it was such an easy, casual thing on stage to be like, hey, President Obama, but you know, what about them aliens? And then not thinking about all those, you know, tens of thousands of people or, you know, millions of people that, that, that are like, yeah, we've been wanting to hear something about this for a long time. And, you know, this is so great to see this. So I, I didn't really think about it in that way. But the second time with Bill Clinton, it was the showrunner that kind of like, because like, you want to ask him about aliens in it again? And I was like, sure, you know, why not? And uh, 
Uh, and I can't remember his uh, his answer, but I think his answer is a little bit more vague. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, well, you know what? I have the clips right here. Um, I no figure way. why don't we go ahead and play them, and okay. um, we'll get your thoughts on the other side. I've got Clinton um, right here on deck, ready to go. So let's just play that, and yeah, okay. we'll see what he had to say when you asked about uh, UFOs. Yeah, man. Right. So that was pretty cool. Um, two things I want to uh, kind of ask you about with that one. Um, the first being uh, Area 51, like you you said, skunk works. I mean, us in the UFO field know the lore, the history behind this deeply, you know, secret military installation in Nevada, uh, where supposedly um, they work on UFOs, uh, back engineer, engineered craft um, from recovered flying saucers, stuff like that. Um, do you have, what are your thoughts on Area 51? Have you ever heard the stories about Bob Lazar, the dude who said he worked there and all that? What do you make yeah. of that whole mythology within the UFO world? Well, I mean, I, I grew up, I, I grew up, uh, you know, I was, I was, I'm an old person. I, I, was, I was born in 1972. So I grew up, uh, during the age of uh, the awareness of Project Blue Book. In fact, there was a television show called Project Blue Book. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and then there was also a show that many of your listeners, well, actually some of your listeners might remember called Salvage One, um, which was about a team of engineers and science enthusiasts that decided to build a rocket <laughs> in, the, in out of a junkyard. <laughs> And uh, eventually, so the whole show was about them, you know, engineering this rocket and then eventually, you know, blasting off and going to space. Nice. Um, but so there was a lot of, and science fiction was huge in the 70s, obviously off the tales of the 60s, the 50s and the 60s, bringing science fiction to the imagination of so many people. Uh, so hearing about Roswell, you know, and about the crash, uh, potential crashed UFO, uh, it all went along with my reality at that time with Project Blue Book um, and my fascination with alien abductions because there were shows kind of like uh, on, you know, during my childhood that would have been, uh, you know, about uh, people's recounting their tales and with sightings and uh, potential abductions and stuff like that. So I was the kid that was in my backyard in a lawn chair staring up at the stars at night, hoping that I would see something. Um, and um, and so in regards to Area, Area 51, obviously like in the 90s, I was listening to Coast to Coast um, radio and they would talk about, you know, things going on at, at Area 51. And of course, all the stories about, you know, well, then there was like <clears throat> movies like Fire in the Sky, um, all these movies about aliens or, you know, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, you know, thinking about Area 51 and also learning about skunk works and knowing and also growing up on an Air Force base in Great Falls, Montana, Maelstrom Air Force Base, I had the good fortune of seeing, um, you know, the SR-71 uh, and uh, seeing the stealth coding up front and, you know, uh, or just real close. I was literally like three feet away from an SR-71 as, as a kid, just like with a small wow. rope, and like, you know, a guy standing there at attention, like, you know, guarding at different points of the airplane. But to see that airplane, one of the, still one of the fastest airplanes ever created, um, with that that coating that not not quite uh, Vanta black, but uh, you know on the same tip as this kind of like it's a shadow, you know, on on the airfield or at least outside the hangars. Seeing that, seeing the stealth fighter, uh, and uh, so many other amazing, you know. Uh, aerial craft and then also seeing like the, the blue angels come through, uh, and, or the, um, uh, the Canadian version, the snowbirds, like seeing snowbirds come through there and do all these aerial formations. So I was absolutely fascinated with, uh, a aviation, uh, of all sorts, but also aliens and science fiction. And so area 51, I think is kind of a mix to me. What I think area 51 is, this is a very long answer, but just, uh, no, in I, short, I, I think area 51 is, is all things. It's a little bit of everything. I think that uh, I think that like because because it's such a focal point and it's such a secretive place. Of course, a ton of lore is going to be generated about it. Do, do I think a craft uh, crashed? Uh, possibly. Uh, you know, the the thing is, there's a couple of angles that come coming at this, and I don't know if that's something we can talk about later. But like, what is 
alien phenomena or what is extraterrestrial? What is the probability that there are extraterrestrial, like extraterrestrials that have vehicles that have visited the planet that are doing this? Are they extraterrestrial or are, were they already here? Are they scout craft? Are they uh, are they autonomous? Uh, are they uh, is it have, does it have something to do with planet Nibiru? You know, this is the ninth planet. Are the Anunnaki coming back? Are like there's like so many. Uh, are we time travelers? Are we visiting ourselves from from the future into the past? Are we trying to? Is this some kind of an experiment, like a gardening experiment with like a, a slightly altered hominid species? And like there's 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 all kinds of things out there that I hold a. 90 to 95 percent possibility margin for because I always leave a little the margin that I could be wrong because we don't fucking know for sure but I definitely lean more in like I've seen too many things I've personally seen UFO uh, or UAPs uh, outside of Great Falls we can talk about that a little bit later but like I uh you know I've seen these things and I have friends that have seen seen things and experienced things so um yeah Again, Area 51, I think, is a little bit of like, perhaps it was a, a an alien craft. Perhaps it was some kind of a craft. Uh, and, uh, and and I wouldn't doubt. I mean, it kind of makes sense. It's like we made a technological jump in such a short period of time uh, with right. stealth, stealth coatings, propulsion systems, um, uh, 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 understanding of electromagnetic fields and how that affects machines and, um, you know, just all kinds of things that were pretty rapidly developed and i don't know if that, that could you could explain it through an escalation of arms race um you could explain it through maybe there's a cosmic transmission of information that's out there that humans are able to tap into or they simply just had machines that they reverse engineered you know from the crash <laughs> i don't know but i'm just saying like i'm open to all the possibilities but i definitely think it's more than just some people some engineers going like this would be a cool thing i think it's a little bit right. more than I love that, man. Yeah, yeah. And who's to say it's not all three in some way, totally. shape, or form? We truly don't know what these UFOs represent. There's probably a million explanations for for each and every one. They're each, you know, as unique as a snowflake, I guess. Yes. But, um, yeah. well, yeah. you know, you bring up another good point, too, is, um, well, first of all, I got to ask you about your UFO sighting. We'll definitely get to that. Um, mm -hmm. Maelstrom Air Force Base. Are you familiar with the incident that happened there, the nuclear the incident? Yeah, the yeah. chase that went across Washington, Idaho, Montana, and I believe North Dakota. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then amazing. there was another incident, I think, um, where uh, at Maelstrom, where UFOs supposedly like came over and shut off the nukes at some point. Have you ever heard that? Story? Oh, yeah, yeah. Was that was that was that Maelstrom? Uh, yeah, because I remember that. Yeah, there was a uh, yeah the 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 story of yeah UFOs appearing over a silo. Yeah, turning. I think. Yeah, turning off and then turning on the system. Uh, yeah, I, so. I actually spoke to um, a gentleman named Robert Sellis. He was the dude in charge of uh, the weapons that day. And, oh, um, wow. dude, he said, like, it was the scariest moment of his whole career. Like, he thought this is the end, you know, Cold yeah. War over, um, we all lose. And uh, it's a pretty crazy story. I, I definitely, I think people should check it out if you're not familiar with that, guys. It, Maelstrom Air it's, Force it's, Base, it's, yeah. I loved hearing this story because, you know, if anything, if you want to like just say like, okay, let's say it's extraterrestrials. I do love, I mean, there's two explanations, right? There's like, well, there's three explanations. One, they were tripping and they don't know what the fuck they're talking about, which I just don't believe because military people, uh, it's not easy for them to come forward. And yes, there's going to be uh, some people that are gonna take advantage of the fact that they're in the military and they're going to just want to like have some sensational, you know, whatever excitement around something that they're saying. And uh, there could be some fibbing going on there. But I'd say in general, those people tend to not, they don't really fuck around that much. And when they get afraid, when they're scared of something that happens, generally it impacts them in a pretty traumatic way because they're used to things being in such a structured, ordered way. When something, when an anomaly occurs, they they really, that really affects them, I I, I would think. Especially when you're in a bunker, you're deep like in a bunker and you control, you're, you're in, you know, you're like the person who authorizes, you know, who actually mechanically makes sure that those missiles go off, those ICBMs yeah. go off. Uh, it's just a position I don't think like you'd want to fuck around with. And you have a career in the military and you don't want to lose your TRICARE medical coverage. You know, like there's, there's a lot of yeah. stuff going on, on there. 
but um so i i would i would be, i believe it and i think that the the other two explanations is one uh there's some extraterrestrial or some unexplained phenomena there's something that appeared over there and just flexed and said we can turn the shit off we can turn the shit on basically get your shit together this isn't the priority nice. that to me is the message this is not the priority and then the other explanation of course is that it's our technology and that we're just kind of testing it you know just like hey let's just send these these vehicles and have them send out an emp whatever and then like see if that works and like oh yeah and it scared the shit out of these dudes it works i don't <laughs> i mean that's I, a little less likely i don't know i i would also i would say option two is probably the most likely yeah it, it is an interesting theory you know we do often hear you know the the government with a capital g when they hear that people are saying oh aliens crash or aliens were seen uh over this this installation let the public think it's aliens just just let them think that you know it is an interesting game i think we play with uh intelligence agencies and whatnot when it comes to all this so yeah you, you do have to wonder um well what what do you think about Clinton when it comes to UFOs, Reggie? I mean, we know that Hillary was really interested. Podesta was obviously very interested. I think he tweeted, you know, his biggest regret um, when he was working with the Clintons was that he did not get the information out to the public about UFOs, um, which is crazy, um, you know. And I know Hillary uh, was working with uh, the Rockefellers and they were looking into UFOs. And there's all these crazy conspiracy theories out there. Um, but when you strip away kind of those layers of the conspiracy theories and just look at it, um, there's no doubt the Clintons probably got closer than anyone when it came to this UFO topic. Um, do you think they know more than what, you know, Bill kind of portrayed when you interviewed him on the Late Late Show? Do you think he knows more than he's telling the public on all this? Man, it's so hard to say. Um, I mean, it's... I guess, you know, people think that the, I don't know, presidents have like more power than they actually do. Like they don't, they don't really yeah. have as much access as people like to think that they have access to. Um, it's not like I'm president. Tell me all the secrets. Like, like <laughs> th things are partitioned and compartmentalized in a, you know, on purpose so that we maintain an edge, you know, in our defense or offensive or defensive strategy militarily. So uh, you know, I would believe that he wouldn't be shown everything. She wouldn't be shown everything. Um, but obviously you're around a lot of people that, you know, have different levels of like how well they can keep a secret. So uh, I'm sure there's, I'm sure that they know more than they're letting on, but I'm also certain that they don't know all of it. So I, I, <clears throat> I think it's something like that. I think that he definitely knows more. I think he's probably talked, if he's that interested, uh, he's asked a lot of questions. Because how can you not? You know, like when you're, you know, you're like the president of the United States, you've had an interest in UFOs for a long time, uh, and uh, or UAPs. And oh, yeah, how would you not, how would you just lose that curiosity? It just doesn't go right. away. Is, is when you're presented with the opportunity to know more, it's like just being a human being and we're all curious creatures. Like we want to know more about stuff and won't settle for just like, well, can't really tell you about that. You know, you're going to keep digging. You're going to keep asking, like, you know, you meet someone and you're like, yeah, I heard they used to be with Project Blue Book. Did you have any opinions on something? You know, whatever. Th that's going to happen. So I'm sure they do know more, but I don't think they know everything. I don't, I don't think that they know definitive stuff necessarily. That's a good point. You know, presidents are temporary. So, you know, can you trust them with all the information once they leave office? I, I don't know, you know, um, especially when they get up there on their deathbeds and they're like, you know, you never know. Are they going to pull the trigger and, and say, yes, you know, aliens crash in Roswell. We've been covering it up. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't think that's a chance they're willing to take, in my opinion. I I, I, I don't think so. I think Obama knows a, a, a little more. Uh, I think he's a, a really more. smart dude. And I mean, Clinton's a smart dude too, but he's a little bit more aloof in a way. Maybe that's his persona, his personal projection. But Obama, 
I get a sense that he definitely knows a lot more because he wanted the what he said was like, I mean, it's not really information we haven't heard heard of really the way he's saying it, but the fact that he's saying it is important. Um, but I also think it, he knows a lot more. Whether it's like these are special weapons programs, this could be like stuff. You know, this could be like NGAD stuff. You know, it's like this could be. Um, whatever the next stealth bomber like you know we're talking about sixth generation fighters you know we're talking you know we're talking about autonomous uh, or you know we're talking about uh, those technologies that people believe that they're creating plasmic fields to create a, a, a false radar signature you're able to project plasmic fields which is kind of like oh that's interesting it creates a physical presence and shows up on radar is that what we could possibly be seeing when at the go fast and the tic tac and stuff like that is that some of that plasmic projection technology is that why it can go from air to water at the same rate of speed because it's not really truly a physical thing but I, you know who, who knows I, I don't know but like you know i have a feeling that he knows more than clinton would necessarily interesting well you know you mentioned obama and his thoughts let's go ahead and play the other clip reggie sure. and get your thoughts on the other side on that um i'll go <laughs> i don't know wow. that i feel like he was the one deflecting there he, i mean he, he like got he got serious for a second yeah and then he turned it on you and started going with the comedy what do you think well you, you could see you could see that he was trying to discern like decide like how much he should say and how he should yeah. say it um, there was this, like, a lot of, like, ah, what should I, because he wanted to say more, but he wanted to say, you know, as much as he could, I guess. I don't know. But there was definitely, it felt there, there was this feeling of, uh, yeah, just, like, he wanted to say more than he, you know, than he was able to say, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I know. Um, which is really interesting, because, you know, um, Obama was around when, supposedly, this ATIP program was going on yeah so you, you do have to wonder you mentioned project blue book earlier i'd love to get your thoughts on this to kind of wrap up the presidents and ufos um yeah between project blue book you know that ended i believe it was in 1969 they said there's nothing to see here we can explain almost all of these things and um they're not posing a threat to national security so we're not going to look into it anymore and then they said, we're done investigating UFOs. The U.S. Air Force is done doing this. And then we come to learn that there was actually a secret Pentagon program called ATIP that had been running. Now, yeah. do you think between that gap between Blue Book and ATIP, there was all this weird UFO X-File stuff still going on in the government? Or truly was this, you know, decades-long gap between uh, investigating UFOs with the U.S. government? That's a, yeah, I mean, I just can't imagine them, you know, like, I don't know, just going like, yeah, we know all the answers, all this is explainable, we're done. I, I don't think that that's true. I think that there's probably an organization that just continues collecting these stories um, and they keep archiving them and like putting them in different categories and just so they have all the information. Maybe there was like a gap in like an actual official department that analyzed the information that um, went and investigated the information, perhaps. Um, but the fact that, you know, Lou Elizondo and, you know, whatever, this, this guy coming out and saying, a tip, I was the head of it, blah, 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 you know, and no one's denying it. It was an actual thing. It's in the black budget, you know, whatever. Uh, it was part of that uh, funding and so forth. But also, you know, it's the government. So you just don't know, at, like, is it like convenient timing? They're releasing this stuff. Is there a reason they're releasing this information? Like, are there is there a reason they're you know corroborating these stories from naval navy fighter pilots? Is it you know radar technicians? All that stuff. Like, there's there's that too. There's that side of it. It it sucks because it's like I don't. I'm not naturally a conspiracy person, but I'm definitely a rationalist, and we also know as human beings as just having a circle of friends or a crew of people when you were growing up, just like the behavior doesn't change. Human behavior is human behavior. And if people want to keep stuff secret or if they want to keep a myth going or if they want to project something, they want to keep a certain air about things, they craft, you know, this informational tech techniques in order to keep us thinking, you know, keep it, keep us guessing. So, and, you know, some people say, like, Elizondo is a, a, a plant, that he's a little bit of a shill, that he's, like, kind of, 
you know, running interference in the community because there are UFO, you know, experts that are kind of refute his, um, I don't know, his like intention, his or yeah. his intentions. Uh, so hard to say. I think that there's definitely data collection the whole time. Obviously, any any story, it just kind of like got brought in and got put into its category, and they just keep building that library of experience, and then. Some of it can be explained because they were running programs in a certain area at that time. So they can like, well, that that gets nixed out. We were running like whatever these like high speed, whatever drone things like that's not us. That's not us. That's definitely not us. That's interesting that we don't have a record <laughs> of that. You know, I'm sure they're doing that at least. Yeah. Or we're doing that. Yeah. Good point. Good point. You know, and they keep saying, you know, it's not Russia. It's not China. It's not these other superpowers who are trying mm -hmm. to keep up with US technology, but, um, mm -hmm. and then they're saying it's not ours. So, you know, I know what is it? What is it? I, That's the I, real I, question. I, I, you know, it's, it's funny to me because it's like, I don't know, man. It, you know, I've been listening to a lot of, uh, I've been listening to this, uh, book, uh, by, uh, well, I guess it's, is it a compendium or, or is it a, a collection? It's, uh, let me see. Where is this? Yeah, it's so it's this book that I've been, uh, the Anunnaki Chronicles. Yeah, Zachariah Sitch Sitchin. Uh, okay. And I've always been interested in ancient alien um, theories uh, just because of the rapid uh, ex escalation, escalation of or evolution of our species just like happening. Mm -hmm. You know, you see that 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 upward trend and then suddenly it just goes, you know, like away from the expected evolutionary curve we just like took a almost a 180 um a 130 uh and <laughs> uh and and it suddenly developed like you know then there's like sumer which just appeared out of nowhere you know <laughs> like 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 oh here's here's or if you want to say it how they say it, they would have said it would have been schumer but uh but so like sumer appears out of nowhere there's like roads libraries uh you know there's educational systems there's taxes there's trade there's commerce there's money just out of nowhere we just suddenly have all this stuff plumbing hmm. um and uh and then all of our tales are built off of these these you know uh these stories these uh i guess uh human origin human uh cultural human civilization stories that get borrowed so you get like these you know, you get um, Arish Kigal, the you know the the goddess of the underworld, and that turns into whoever that turns into for the Akkadians and the Assyrians, and then you get to like Egypt, and you have Anubis, and then you have Charon for for the Greeks, uh, and you have Hades for the Romans, and it's like all these like par borrowed tales from way way back then, but before then there wasn't anything. So it's it's there's a lot of like interesting questions and also in the bible there there are, there are stories and and other other ancient texts but there are there's stories of these lights in the skies and these formations that match the description of things that people are still see have been seeing since well since then really um and then then you have to ask the question well these are similar light formations and similar similar phenomena that human beings have experienced have been experienced experiencing for hundreds of years or thousands of years and only now could we say, oh, that was could have been a drone, you know, that that could have been like some weird experimental aircraft or that's a weather balloon or whatever, because those, those things didn't exist, whatever, 120 years ago. We didn't have any of these things that you could say, oh, that's what it is. It's it's modern technology. So then how do you account for similar sightings for thousands of years and then suddenly be like, well, now it's these things like, has it always been those things? Has it always been drones? <laughs> has it always been weather balloons? Has it always been Saturn or Jupiter? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Such a good point. You know, you look at um this idea of the cargo cult, you know, when a a civilization mm. had, has no idea any frame of reference at what they're looking at in the sky. Let's say it was a whatever, a, a B-29 bomber that went over mm their island and they've never seen a plane before and then boom a new religion starts after they see this thing in the sky yes, so you truly yeah. do have to wonder these different cultures throughout history um who have these quote-unquote ufo sightings you know what springs up with that what beliefs come from that and and what are the what does it truly represent did it want to be seen and start a religion or um is that just by human condition i i don't know it is fascinating though it is 
Yeah, I, I, I love it. And, and, you know, and then when you go back and you just look at the evidence of, you know, past societies, you know, you look at the, the, uh, the pyramids, you know, and of course the argument of like, you can't get a razor blade between some of those, you know, 30 ton, 40 ton. And you're like, how did human beings have the time, the initiative, the technology, you know, to build these things and the fact that there were no bodies discovered in any of the, you know, the great pyramids, except, except for, was it Khufu was found in one, uh, in the center I of I think it. you're it was, right. I have like to brush only, up on my history. <laughs> yeah, but that was like the only one. All the rest of them were empty. There and there were no carvings. There was no, uh, sorry, no hieroglyphs, no pictographs, uh, like anywhere uh, inside of these structures. Um, and then when one was found, it was a forgery uh, that this guy wanted to claim that he had found the grave of something, blah blah blah. But then they found that that was actually a forgery, and there was a family of the person who claimed it that said, "Yes, it was definitely a forgery." Um, so. You know what were these pyramids what were they used for why are there similar structures in egypt and uh you know central america um why you know do we have these pictures of these it's either like human imagination like like looking at nature and going like what if the soul could be carried on the back of a flying eagle you know like or the buzzard you know with glowing eyes like is it just us having some mushroom trips going like, man, what if the universe was crazy? And then we're just like making these stories or are they based off of real things that occurred? You know, are they, you know, the fact that Elohim or sorry, Yahweh is a plural name, not a singular name, not mono. There wasn't a monotheism back in the early days. It talked about a mm -hmm. system or the hierarchy of gods and uh, that these gods were called like the gods, the God of creation, the God of heaven and earth, the God of water, the God of blah, 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 blah. Um, were these actual beings, were they, uh, you know, were we a work race that were created by, you know, manipulating, uh, uh, you know, genetic or uh, genetic code? Uh, is it something like alien, like in the beginning of that, a last alien, whatever covenant movie where the guy's like pouring his, like, he's giving up his DNA into the waters of the, of the earth yeah. to, in order to like create a new hominid species. You know, I don't know, but it's, it's possible, but then I can go one step. I can go one step further back than that, um, which is more, is I think kind of fun, a little bit more fun. Please do, we, yeah. We, uh, uh, well, sure. So uh, basically like the idea of consciousness itself, like what is consciousness? And uh, mm -hmm. and is consciousness, is it a collective consciousness? Are we living in a holographic, a collective conscious universe? Is this some kind of a simulation of sorts without it and without necessarily thinking about computers and the matrix and everything like something, a simulation of sorts like con consciousness running the game of consciousness in order to strengthen the idea of consciousness and awareness. And in which case, if that's if that's true and all possibilities, uh, as 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 we learn in physics, at least you know, theoretically, we talk about many worlds, multiple dimensions, uh, variable, mm -hmm. uh, variable possibilities, choose your own adventure style, like, like you know, whatever the, uh, you know, me choosing this leads to this, leads to that, leads to that, blah, blah, blah. But all the possibilities exist simultaneously on the horizon. Then we have to go back and think, well, the idea of extraterrestrials is highly likely, but also in a way that's more fantastic than just craft and beings inside of craft influencing our society. It's more like it's just the possibility of of that occurring is very high because essentially history doesn't exist as we move forward. Like all of that stuff yeah. is just they're just memories that are collectively sewn together to explain where we are in the present moment as we're experiencing reality in real time. So if I think of it that way, then, yeah, of course, there's like whether we're receiving, you know, where, let's say back in back in the day, you're receiving ideas from another version of ourselves that has a higher awareness and we're able to glean some of that and put it into our current reality and make an advancement of sorts whether it's that um consciousness communicating over vast you know distances in order to like influence itself just for the sake of influencing itself i don't know well that, i mean that's obviously getting kind of very esoteric but i do like thinking of it that way because then it means that anything is possible and not to take away from anybody's experience like you know, an abduction experience or, you know, coming into contact with exotic materials or seeing something that definitely is not explainable with a, with a bunch of people. It just kind of, it proves that that's possible, you know, that that is a reality that we are collectively deciding the reality that we, that we want to be experiencing at all times.
Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I really like that that thought experiment. Um, yeah. Well, I I heard you once, Reggie, say uh, that ghosts actually we're going paranormal now. Ghosts are sure. like a temporal anomaly, and I absolutely love that that phrase in terms of you know in the UFO world we've had people come forward and say that as well. You know, beyond reality consciousness, but um, time and space that maybe these UFOs represent time travelers, um, you know, mm-hmm. or yes. these little gray alien beings, you know, very uh, androgynous and small bodies, big heads, you know, maybe their brains got bigger, bodies got smaller. And this is a version of us in like, what, three, 500, a thousand years from now. And they're coming back to see what we once were. What do you make of that whole? theory of ufos and aliens being time travelers i i love it i'm a huge time traveler fan like my whole existence is based off of uh experiencing time travel or what what i like to call artificial time travel um whether it's you know going into a vr simulation or whether it's telling stories with one another um or whether it's um you know, uh, visiting somewhere and not having immediate access to your normal technology that tells you where you are in time. And then you kind of have like this weird flash of like, was this, was this what 1993 was like, you know, whatever. (laughs) So I'm, I'm a huge, I'm a huge lover of time travel and the possibility of time travel. I think it's a very fantastic thing. I think that that, again, it's totally possible because everything is possible. And if all realities and, and possibilities exist simultaneously, then it just depends on are you lucky enough to fall into you know uh, a reality where that reveals itself. Um, so I think I think it's very possible. I mean, I do like the idea of like this tourism. Like like what were we like? You know, back in back in time. <laughs> come come on a journey and take a, take a sample and look at what we what we were like back in the day. You know, like we were we were smart, but we also very dumb. And we also tried to segregate ourselves and divide ourselves and say that we were multiple different things when we were part of the same thing. And but look how far we've come. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's like this disaster tourism. But um, you know, <laughs> and 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 the idea of like us evolving, you know, to a to a point at which our bodies change and you know our, we've got bigger brains. But then the, the question is is like why this planet you know like why yeah why why us why are we why are we special you know like why you know and and then that kind of gets me down to well it kind of makes sense that it, we're kind of running some kind of we're part of some kind of an experiment you know where it's like what 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 the fuck are we doing here like you know why do we why are we like basically transforming reality the ingredients of reality the hard re- ingredients of reality and copying what nature does like a oh, bird flies well we better figure out how to fly well um you see how centipedes move maybe we can create a a, a thing like that oh here's a tank oh, okay all right well here's a you know here's you see how tough beetles are or whatever they have that chitin on there's like well, what if we created armor for us you know like everything we do we're just rip off artists the human species is a big simulation species we just rip off right. everything around us that's all we do because we want to be that we want to experience it it's like well i want to be able to go underwater and you know for months and it's like well let's create a boat that enables us to live under there but so or space we want to go out into space we want to take whatever this intersection of senses are smell sight taste we want we have to like move that point of consciousness to another reality in order to reinforce our connection to reality or to just to see if it's possible like we're always moving ourselves to see if it's possible and i think like half of or most of what ufo or uip phenomena is is people knowing that we are more than what we seem and seeking answers um that lead to the fantastic but the fantastic is quite possibly the reality and uh and for whatever reasons we have these blinders on on purpose in order to like kind of keep us i guess functioning you know, like living, like I'm hungry now, must find food. Oh, cold, must need shelter. Like we have all these basic things to keep our entity alive, but the questions of who are we, where are we from, what is all of this? That's kind of, I think at the core of every single human being, no matter how, whatever, gross an individual is being at that time, we all come from that place. We're a curious problem solving species 
that is like become awake, you know, and 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 are asking the question like, what the fuck is going on? I mean, basically, basically is the, is the if humanity could be encapsulated, it'd be like, what the fuck is going on? Like that's all we're doing. We're just constantly like going, what the fuck is going? Why the fuck is that? Why are you? How come you're? Why is this? How come this? Well, if you get ah, you know, that's that's all we're doing constantly. So it makes sense that we would want to figure out what is the mechanism behind it? What is, what is reality? What's happening? And um, it doesn't make sense to be close-minded about uh, reality because, you know, like I said, I've seen UFOs. I, I was, you know, I was a teenager in Montana. We were camping, we we're in a valley and uh, we decided to go on a really long walk at night. And we did, we went through a cattle fence. We were walking across this huge, huge field, a couple of miles to get to a butte. And uh, halfway across that journey um, to the butte, uh, we, you know, I looked down this kind of system of plateaus and I saw three lights and the three lights were kind of moving, but kind of at different distances, you know, from each other as they moved. And uh, so I knew that most likely the, it was, they were separate things, individual things, mm -hmm. individual craft. And then at one point, one stopped and you could see a bright light kind of appear under it and then it turns off and then it starts moving again. And I got my friends, I kept looking at it, you know, I kept looking at the those lights and I called my friends over and I was like, tell me what you see. I didn't describe what I was seeing. I just said, tell me what you see. And they saw the same thing. So I said, see these three lights. I don't know if they saw the stopping, whatever uh, light underneath, but they de definitely saw those things. Those are two of my friends. And we saw, saw those things. There was no sound and it makes no sense why something would be glowing. You know, like why, why would you, why would the Air Force create something or, you know, whatever, uh, these craft that are glowing and are they the same exact craft that were being chased across in 1950s, you know, by squadrons of fighter jets that are scrambled to follow these objects across the Canadian border? Like, why hasn't that design changed? You know, I don't know, but there's just like, you know, like what seeing that I was like, wow, to feel to see something like that is crazy. It does a crazy thing to your mind because you're like, if it is not, if it's not, if it is what I think it is, that's fucking insane that I'm watching, that I'm seeing it in reality. It's like seeing a, you know, a magician do a trick for you in front of your face. And you're like, how I got to Let me look at that. And you're like looking at the thing and you're like, that's not it. How the fuck, you know, like that trick where you're like, is magic real in that moment? that fantastic moment. That's what it felt like when seeing that. I was like, I can't believe I'm seeing this. This is this is what I'm seeing. It is an unidentified flying object. It's definitely UAP. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't say that it is aliens, but I'm definitely seeing something that makes no fucking sense. Also, it makes no strategic sense at all. Like, I don't know why yeah. you would create craft like that. Like, I don't, I don't know what that gets us other than like, aliens are attacking. Oh shit, everybody's afraid. I, I mean, there's... I don't know what that gets you either. I think you just want to make an efficient weapon that could infiltrate an in, in, in enemy, you know, what aerospace or whatever space, and then just like inflict what it needs to inflict and get the fuck out of there. I don't think it has anything about it being glowing. But anyways, uh, all that ranting and raving to say that I, uh -huh. I know that feeling. I know that feeling. And it's fucking crazy. It's amazing. That's awesome, man. Yeah, so many people say... You know, having a UFO experience is euphoric in, in, you know, lack of a better term. Or for some people, it's terrifying. Some it's beautiful. Um, you know, I talked to a mother and a daughter in Michigan who saw the same triangular shaped UFO over their mm -hmm. home. You know, the mom saw it first, Jeez. told the daughter, come out, come see this with me. Daughter comes out and they're looking up at this thing and the mother's looking at it and she's like, oh my God, I feel this is so awe inspiring. It's amazing. It's like, you know it's white, it's bright white and it's so bright. And uh, this is amazing. It's angelic. And she's like, wow. what, do you, what do you think? What do you think? She turns to her daughter and her daughter, dude, she's on the ground in the fetal position, like covering her ears oh. and saying how unbearably loud the UFO was oh. when the mom said it was completely silent. And then the daughter oh. also said it was slick black. And they're like, interesting. I, I didn't know what to make mm -hmm. of it, man. When they told me this story, they're having like completely different perceptions of supposedly looking at the same thing. So then you also have to wonder, like, is this UFO or whatever sources behind it able to 
change perception or or is it amorphous in some sense? I don't know, but I think you're right. There's some sort of um, disruption to reality when it comes to these things. And people experience them so differently. You know, I'm sure your friends took something completely different away from that experience than you did. You just, you don't know what how someone will carry on with their life after something like that, I guess. Yeah, it's 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 impossible because you know people there are instantaneous rationalizations that happen. You know that that are, you know, is your brain trying to protect itself? You know, it's running every scenario of what it could be, and some people choose to reduce it to something mundane. Uh, you know, there's that phenomena that people talk about where if there's a party happening, you know, in somebody's living room or something like that, and someone stepped into the room in a gorilla costume and waved its arms and then walked out and closed the door again, a lot of people wouldn't think of it as a big deal at all. And some people might not even remember it. And, uh, and, and there's something that happens when we see something so unexplainable or surprising or whatever it is, uh, they, there's an instantaneous rationalization because they're like, well, it can't be what you think, what you think it is because it, I mean, or what you fear it is, let's say, or what you're hoping it is, uh, because, uh, it's just probably not what it is. And so, so some people just kind of go like, I register it. Yeah. And then just kind of like, let it go. Whereas other people will be like, Holy shit, that's the thing I've been looking for, you know, or that's the thing that because I've been looking for it, it resonates to me. You know, there's like something about it that's giving me information. Whereas other people will be like totally terrified. Um, instead of yeah. curious. So uh, it totally makes sense. I mean, what do you expect? It's, you, you, you know, most of the things, people get a surprise at the dumbest things, you know? And when I say dumb, <laughs> I just mean like the simplest things, you know? They're 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 like, oh shit, that's, you know, I mean, look at like, uh, uh, you know, those healers or whatever, you know, that are just like, now you're healed, you know? And, there's, and, and people are like, oh, I'm healed, you know? And they're just walking around for a while and their doctor's like, yeah, you made your injury worse. But like, um, you know, like the, the people, people will believe or disbelieve things based on the availability that they have of self-awareness in that moment. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, you know, her, that, that's a wonderful story, but seeing that craft, it, it, it's, it makes sense. Some people are going to be like, holy shit, this is it. You know, oh, this is them. Other people are like, ah, it doesn't exist. I'm out of here. G school, Blake, I don't know. You know, like, uh, you know, it's like, I'd rather not. And then like people ask them about it later. They're like, I don't know what it was. Let's not talk about it. You know, whatever. Yeah. Like everyone, of course, everyone's going to react differently. Yeah. It's fascinating. It really is. Um, well, Reggie, I've got a couple of listener questions. Yeah. If you're willing to sure. stick around, we've almost been sure. going for an hour. So thank you. Thank sure. you for your time, man. Do you like stories of the strange, the weird, and the unexplained? Then we want you to check out Jim Harold's Campfire. The concept is pretty simple. Jim talks to regular people about strange stuff that happens to them. And yes, that includes UFOs, along with cryptids, ghosts, and head scratchers. He doesn't exaggerate or play a lot of spooky music, kinda like I'm doing right now. The stories speak for themselves. One's like a ghost story involving serial killer Ted Bundy, or the young man who encountered an eight-legged demon. Then there's the story of an alien abduction by what could be considered a reptilian. Now not all the stories are horrifying, some are actually pretty heartwarming like a visit from a past loved one, or a peaceful near-death experience. Regardless, these are true and fascinating stories told by ordinary people who've had extraordinary experiences. Tune in to Jim Harold's Campfire on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to Somewhere in the Skies. And remember, stay spooky. Hey guys, Ryan here. The Somewhere in the Skies podcast is a labor of love every week. And with that comes many different costs to keep the show running. That's where our Patreon campaign comes in. You give what you think the show is worth. 
there's different rewards available all the time, including shoutouts on the show, early editions of main episodes, bonus episodes and content, and very soon, monthly patron hangouts, where we sit back and chat all things UFOs. So I hope you'll consider becoming a Patreon subscriber today. To learn more and to join, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. Thank you for your support and keep looking up. Um, no problem. This first one comes from uh, one of our Patreon subscribers. They get priority to ask our guests questions. Um, and this is from Ondeg. And they ask, uh, what does Reggie, does he have a theory um, about what UFOs are? I know we briefly touched on that. Um, mm-hmm. But do you think it's possible that they could have been here, Ondeg wants to know, longer before us? You know, this. there's this famous line from the X-Files, I think, where, you know, in like the second episode, the weird spooky government agent guy is like, Mr. Mulder, they've been here for a very, very long time. And I mm. remember watching that as like a 12-year-old and that like gave me shivers. I'm like, wait, what does that mean? Like before us? Um, what do you make of that whole theory that maybe uh, we're not even the earthlings per se? We just came on a comet here and hitched a ride and came to earth and there was something here before us. I don't know. Does that make any sense to you, that theory? Of course. Yeah, of course it makes sense. I mean, it it makes sense again in the ancient alien um, hypothesis. Uh, Yeah, it would make sense. I mean, we, I just wouldn't be surprised. I mean, we hear about things like Lemuria and Atlantis and these civilizations that existed before us. Um, And, uh, you know, I, Again, I do. I do think it's possible um, because the universe is it's just too insane. I mean, we live in a reality that's too insane. And the more instruments we create to like analyze our, our reality, the more baffled we are. You know, like the the smaller we look, uh, the, like we look at scanning electron microscopes. You know, we go to atom smashers and we're studying like isotopes and you know all these things. And then we're like, well. Theoretically, you know, there should be this much distance between, you know, the nucleus of this or whatever. It's like, well, what is the nucleus made of? Well, it's theoretically, it's but it's like dark, dark energy. All these, like, they it just gets muckier and muckier the smaller we look. And then as we look out, right. like especially with the James Webb telescope, we're looking back in time, but we're starting to see these anomalies where you're like, that shouldn't be there. Oh, that's surprising. Oh, weird. There's carbon dioxide in that in, in the atmosphere of that of that exoplanet. Like, it's just more mystery. So we're sandwiched between mystery, like the point at which we exist and what, how we're able to perceive reality. And no matter how many instruments we're able to peer like further back in time or out into time, which again is looking back in time, but like the, whatever, wherever we look, we keep looking more, more, more and focused in in a specific direction. It's like fractals. It never ends. Like just when you think, Oh, that point, this thing coming at me right now, I know what this is. That's, oh, that's nothing. That's nothing at all. It continues to be nothing. It continues to be everything. It continues to be nothing. So I think that idea of beings existing, you know, here on this planet before this particular incarnation of consciousness that we are currently is is highly likely. I, I wouldn't see, I couldn't see why not. I mean, we, it feels like we were using the scraps of a former sim- civilization that that's what we're doing we're just like piecing together the scraps of an earlier a more advanced civilization to me interesting I, I like that um the whole fractal concept is fascinating to me um that uap girl on twitter reggie asks uh top three earthlings you'd send in first for contact if we were to ever make contact with whatever ufos represent whatever intelligence is behind them who would you put first in line or i guess first second and third in line to uh make that first contact mm. well a lot of the people are dead uh but uh, that's okay you know, Carl, Carl sagan okay would be an amazing person good choice um uh, you know i mean buckley would be another person but i think uh well no i think let me think about this. Well, I would love to. I would love to hang out <laughs> and say hi and just be like, Hell "Hey guys, what's going on?" You know, I would love to. So I put myself in there. Um, and I'm trying to think of someone a little bit. Oh, well, 
I mean, like Sun Ra would want to for sure, but uh, he's no longer around. But I, I think uh, I'm trying to think of like an artist, but it has to be someone who's. Oh, you know what? Well, I don't know. Oh, that's a weird one. His his art. I, it has to be someone who's a good communicator. I don't know. I, I would say probably uh, Alex Gray is an interesting guy, you know, mm. or Sarah Silverman. I, 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 mm. Yeah. I, I I put some of those people. I think Sarah would be great because she's a good she's a rationalist, but she's also a very compassionate person. I, I think it requires people that are a little bit emotionally connected, emotionally uh, empathic, but also very rational. I, I think that those are the people we'd want to send in there. I love that. Um, you know, a question I didn't get to you was um it seems to me when I talk to people outside of the quote unquote UFO community, it's usually either musicians or uh, comedians or some sort of artist. And you said it right there, you know, you'd like to have an artist be one of the first people to make contact. What do you think it is about musicians and artists? I mean, I, if I went back in my catalog of shows, I would say like a healthy 30, 40% have been musicians or, or an artist of some kind. What do you think that says? about these phenomena and those who seem to want to pursue that mystery, I guess. Well, I think, I think, um, as an artist, when you're, when you're creating things, uh, it depends on, you know, how you view what creativity is and where it comes from and so forth. But I think, um, it feels like channeling to, to an extent and it keeps your mind in open, uh, in an open state. So in order to, especially for what I do improvising, like you have to be open to all possibilities in that moment. And you have to also initialize something. You have to start with something. And as you start, you build on it because you're kind of listening to possibilities and those things are collapsing into the, the higher probabilities. And then you just kind of, you know, allow those probabilities to kind of flow through you. And so I think that that element of, and then also the dreaming, you know, the not quoting the Sandman, but like, like the, the, the dreaming element of being an artist of visualizing a world, imagining a scenario, seeing certain things. It's very like big, open, imaginative, and you understand the power of, of limitless possibility. And I think that the idea that we're just, yeah, you know, some, some organisms, you know, with an endoskeleton walking around, just trying to survive and procreate. Like, I think that that's boring. <laughs> I think that that's very boring because why are we even able to think about those things? Why am I able to think about the thing that I'm thinking about that I am, mm. you know? And I think that those are the questions that artists think about. And the same thing with scientists, I, you know, as, as I've said, science and art, those are the only two things that really matter. Uh, everything is in between those things. And, but they're both interchangeable um, because science creates, well, science reveals fantastic things that we, that we, may not, most of us may not ever imagine mm -hmm. um artists are able to tap into and project concepts that might be real so the two of them together it's great it's like it's empirical but it's also visionary and uh but the empirical evidence also which is great about science is that they don't say that they know anything for sure it's like we just know what we know in this given time and these are all this is the consensus of where we're at right now our understanding could change because our theoretical element is now saying, well, maybe it could be, this could be a product of this. It's theoretical. And then we invent some instruments or whatever. And then suddenly we're like, actually a little bit of that theory is true. And then it evolves. So, and art kind of does the same thing in that techniques evolve, ways of representing things evolve. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a never ending cascade of possibility uh, when it comes to, what art can create and what it can project and how it affects people. And the same thing with science. Science is like, well, we're curious. We want to find stuff out, but we also want to be empirical about it. And, um, and both methods are very, very interrelated because they, they, they inspire one another, you know, spaceship design is inspired by earlier science fiction writers, science fiction, science fiction writers write about certain formations of hierarchical society or non hierarchical society. And then suddenly down the line, there's a, civilization that starts using some of those ideas or whatever you know what i mean it's like they they all yeah. influence each other so. i love that yeah it's like a choreographed dance you know you need both need both partners the uh, realists and the dreamers for it to uh 
continue. Yeah. Um, got a couple yeah. of music questions for you, Reggie. Ooh, um, nice. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, Joss Horror on Instagram asks, have you ever sampled any sound from UFO or alien movies uh, for your freestyles and loops? By the way, I love your work and thank you for talking about UFOs, Joss said. Oh, sick. That's <laughs> awesome. It's my pleasure. It's one of my favorite things. Uh, no, I have not. But I do I do, do a lot. I, I, I take a lot from science fiction movies. Like, uh, yeah, so sometimes like in my sets, I'll be whatever, doing my thing. It may not be musical, but sometimes I'll, you know, I'll pretend I'm in like a giant like mech suit or whatever. And, <laughs> you know, and so I'm just like, <laughs> or a jet, you know, where it's just like, <laughs> you know, like all these like sounds that I hear and I mimic uh, because I'm, just fascinated with them. So I, I do sample the things that I'm exposed to and use them uh, vocally or conceptually in my pieces. Love that. I love that. Um, Isaac, kind of in the same vein, uh, Isaac on Facebook asks, uh, does your understanding of sound rhythm and harmony affect your understanding in relationship with the phenomenon? If so, how? Mm. I, I think it does because you know, again, we're 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 just an intersection of of frequency detecting sensors, and um, uh, you know we're an intersection of those things. So, and some most of us have all of the senses. Some of us don't, or some of us has have lost a few of those senses. But we have enough of them that we can still localize ourselves uh, in in space. And so, I think that. Uh, being a musician, especially because music is so dependent on frequency and vibration, uh, and sympathetic uh, uh, dissonance, um, harmonance, like all of these elements that music uh, that music is, is what life is. And I think when when you realize like vibe, intent, like I was on the airplane yes yesterday or yeah yesterday. And yes, I had a little bit of a hash edible, but I was, I was, uh, I was, it was the first time I'd experienced this. I was on, I was on the airplane, the airplane took off. And as you know, there's a lot of sounds an airplane makes when it takes off. Mm -hmm. And some people are afraid of those things. But for me, I start to notice what those things are. So when you hear that after the plane has taken off, you that's, that's just the landing gear. It's the it's the rotation of the tires after it's left the tarmac. They're still rotating, and then as the landing gear go in, you hear the speed roll off until they finally stop rotating. And I felt that I felt it through the floor because I was closer to the front of the plane and the, the front landing gear. I felt when that wheel stopped rotating, and then I knew the flaps when uh, were coming up because the plane started to feel a little bit different than the no you know all the noises and then here's here's the incredible thing the guy next to me was sneezing and i wasn't wearing a mask um and and i was like oh shit this guy's just sneezing but i knew that it wasn't covid well okay i 98 percent knew in my head i knew that it wasn't because i knew that it was allergies i could i could tell by the way he was sniffing and the way that he was breathing that it was allergies. It wasn't, wow. I'm sick, I'm sick. So these types of things, that I, and that was like yesterday, and that was kind of like a new moment for me in, 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 in a way, because I started going, oh, I understand what's going on with this thing. Or you're on a bridge and you're hearing it creak or whatever, you're like, no, that's that's just the structure giving way because it needs to be flexible or, you know, or, oh no, oh, that's actually, that is an earthquake. You know, like like there have been many times where I've gotten up from I was in the yoga class and I got up and I was like earthquake or whatever. People thought I was crazy <laughs> and they didn't feel anything. And then like in the news reports, like a three point three or earthquake, whatever. You know, so I think being a musician, uh, you know, in short, it it if you if you want to, not all musicians do this, but but there's a higher likelihood that you're sensitive to vibrations and shifts in energy uh, around you. Um, and that's how improvisation works. That's why music is so magical. Why it just like levit it feels like it, you're levitating when something really starts to take off and, and everything's feeding off of each other. And it just, it, it reaches a synchronicity where it's just like, and it's all like huh, synchronized. And like those plates that you see 
people run vibrational frequencies and they pour sand on it and you see mm -hmm. they'll turn up the frequency and then you'll see the shape kind of look like this and then they'll change the frequency and it'll go like that type of stuff you're you're aware of that that those molecules are taking on shapes according to uh vibration so i long answer but i love that question because uh it's it's something i've been encountering or more sensitive to uh lately i think that that when it comes to phenomena like uap and so forth or uh, alien intelligence and so forth i i think that it lets you know that you have access to all of that which is which is to say we have access to all forms of consciousness and uh alien or otherwise because there isn't really at least this is in my humble opinion there isn't such thing as alien consciousness it's like we're we are all part of consciousness and so it's just the revelation of different forms of consciousness and also and then i'll add this the i love the term life form because whenever i see an ant when i see a, a you know a, like scanning electron a, a microscope you know shot of a water bear or whatever they're all life forms they're forms of life and these forms of life are all around us and we're all a part of it we're all we're all life but as humans we like to think well because i'm conscious and i can decide that i can do this and do this or make this like this makes me different from all the rest of life it's like it's just a bunch of bullshit. we're just it's like we're all made of the same shit. it's all just frequencies and vibrations and formations of matter and consciousness observing itself but anyways that, that, that. i love it i love it life form Life form for sure, man. Um, yeah. Last musical question. Uh, yeah. What is your favorite musical instrument that you've yet to use? Anything you just haven't Ooh. been able to get your hands on or, or, or even start to practice yet? <sighs> wow. An instrument that I haven't used that I want to. Um, I'd say it's an instrument that doesn't exist yet. Uh, there's an instrument I, I want. I want, I use loopers uh, for my performances and there is no looper that I absolutely love. Like I have an electric <laughs> car that I 100% love. Um, like I'm completely satisfied driving this vehicle, like a hundred percent. And in my life, that's what I look for. I look for experiences of total satisfaction. Um, and, but I'm not so harsh that I'm not, I'm going to miss it. Like, like I do take note, like, you know, like flashlights, like this flashlight, not this one particularly, there's another one, but there's a flashlight that I use that I'm 100% satisfied with. Like there's nothing I would change really about the design, well, except for USB-C port for recharging. But um, uh, other than that, I'm fully satisfied. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, oh, wait a minute, what was I talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, the instrument you've yet to use oh, is the yeah. instrument that's yet to be... Uh creative gotcha. right right uh, yeah i'm back i went i went too far out but uh yeah so so why i said all that is because i don't have a looping pedal there's no there's i mean the line six which is my my the most well-known pedal that i that i use uh that line six is almost a, a perfect pedal it's it's very close but not quite and then the other multi-track loopers i use they, they do their jobs well and I can make music with it, but I can't, I can't rock that shit in a hardcore way intuitively because the controls are not intuitive. And so I guess I, I just say that I, there is an instrument that I want to play. You know, I would love to develop some kind of a cello like looking instrument that had multiple buttons that I could, you know, manipulate. And then I could also tilt, which would create effects or move forward that would uh, create effects that I could hold close to my body and I could just really integrate with and play rhythms and chords and also trigger looping things. So the answer is that there isn't, uh, that instrument doesn't exist yet. So I'm working on it. Love it. Love it. It's constantly evolving. Um, well, I guess here's one last question I found really interesting that I'd love to get your thoughts on, kind of wrap things up, Reggie. Um, Hampton Steves on Twitter asks, is love an illusion born of biological necessity? I love that. Yeah, I think I saw that on Twitter. Yeah. Um, I thought that was an excellent question. I'm glad that you asked it. Uh, I think it's both. I think that there is um, definitely, you know, chemicals that are released uh, that are you responding to 
a, a vibe, a physical representation and a vibration that you get from somebody that you're with that says, hey, man, you should hang with this person on a biological level. It's like you should hang with this person because you're going to make great offspring. Like that's like that's 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 definitely there. It's like, boy, you should get together with that person because those kids, they're going to be really cool. You know, uh, there's definitely that. Whether that's true or not, that's the message that biology is like. Yeah, let me hook on to you so we can make more of you. But uh, I think that love is a greater energy than that. I think that love is, um, yeah, love is like. It, to me, it's, it, love is the building block of all reality. I think that I think that all of reality is love, and I think that anything else is you know not love it's a, or getting for let's say it's further away from love it's uh desynchronizing with love well, you know whether it's like people who are frustrated all the time or people angry all the time or people complaining all the time all the stuff that we can do as humans we can choose to be however we want to be um i think that it for some weird reason it it's in according to this current manifestation of reality it seems to be easier to complain and to be frustrated and angry about stuff uh, and it's harder to just be like, you know what? Like, I think Sarah Silverman, I watched a thing on, on Instagram that she did. She had this realization that I thought was pretty great where she, she woke up and this is probably, you know, some version of this is in B Buddhist and Taoist, you know, uh, writings, but she woke up going like, ah, nothing matters. Uh, everything sucks or whatever. And, and I understand that, that thinking like, ah, nothing matters. Nothing matters. Then, you know, why are we even here? What's blah, 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 blah. But then she kind of like took it full circle and she was about to do a show and she does kind of like what I like to do before a show, which is like, people say like, what do you do before a show? And I'm like, I don't do anything. I just like fuck around with people until it's absolutely time to get on the stage. And then mm -hmm. as I'm approaching the stage, I say to myself, you know what? None of this fucking matters. I'm, um, and uh, just fuck it. Like that, that's my attitude. I go on stage <laughs> and I just go up there and I just do what needs to happen in that moment. And, um, and I think that, that's kind of the thing that you arrive at when you're like, oh, all this shit that I'm so, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, I do it every day with the news cycle. I, I need to take breaks. I really honestly do. But I'll do that with it because I'm like, no, no, it's, uh, this is moving in the wrong direction, you know. And then I'm just thinking, how does this affect my general outlook in life? Like, am I really going to, like, ruin my day with shit that ultimately doesn't matter because as long as I'm being the best person I can be and I'm trying to, project that in the world around me, wherever I go, I'm trying to do my best wherever I go. And other people are doing that and we're recognizing that one another. It's like, oh, this person's trying. Oh, this person helped this person with this thing. Yeah, they have totally different ideologies, but they both fixed that plank that was loose in the fence. You know, like that's, these are, these are things that I, that I, that I live for in life. And so, uh, so yeah, I, I think that love is kind of everything. That's like the constant that's there if we want to listen to it. But it's easy to forget and to get lost into all the into all the the dramatic things. So your life can feel like a constant crisis, or you can be in what I like to call a solution based mind state, which is like you can be affected by something, you can take on, you can process the emotion of something, uh, but solve, create a solution so that that doesn't occur again, or less likelihood you know of that occurring but just be in a solution base because otherwise if we're all just like oh fuck everything sucks everything uh it, it gets us nowhere and then we're 80 years old looking back on our lives going like god i was really healthy and i had a perfectly functioning body and look at all that time i wasted like <laughs> fucking around with me being just you know disappointed about shit when shit was right. mostly fine mostly fine but helping each other was the important thing I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, well, looking towards the future, Reggie, um, you know, yeah. we're scientific breakthroughs, technology. Like you said earlier, um, we had this huge boom back during the industrial age, obviously, and with space exploration. And now we're living in a world of, you know, where quantum physics is becoming more of a reality. Um, and looking at the UFO topic that way as well. Uh, mm -hmm. With all of this happening at a rapid pace, do you think we'll ever truly know what these UFOs or UAPs are or represent? Do you have hope that we'll ever know the truth about what all of this stuff is? Or uh, will it remain a mystery for forever? I know you always say life is 
you know, always happening. Life just keeps happening. Um, <laughs> yeah. Will we always live in the mystery or will we get those answers? What do you personally feel? I, I, I think we will. Uh, and, and on some level, we already know, you know, I, I think, you know, it's like, um, but it's nice to have that certainty. You know, I mean, I guess that's something that we as humans, we love. We love like knowing something, you know, we love a certainty. Um, but I think that for me, I, I think that it's, you know, I've been doing, uh, I've been interesting, I'm interested in something, I, something I call the paradoxical state, uh, which is, um, is being aware of all infinite possibilities and being aware of the absence of those possibilities simultaneously. Because in that moment, in that moment where those two things intersect, I call it the, it's a paradoxical state. In that state, you realize all things are possible, but all things are not not possible at the same time, which to me is the truest state of reality in in a, in a way. Without it's just like it just cascades into an infinite like uh, you know yin yang positive negative. But I think that in our current reality, we can achieve understanding. We can definitely achieve knowledge through the discovery of things and the understanding of things and the acceptance of things. And I think that we definitely will know. I mean, we have to. I mean, it's a phenomena, right? It's something that observable. Um, and I think that we definitely will, because if it if it exists, then it's reproducible or it's re-experienceable. Um, and there is an answer for its uh, existence because everything has a everything has a place and everything is useless simultaneously. But I think you know it's like, uh, uh, but but I mean, without being cheeky, I, I do think that it is possible that we will know what these things are because, in a way, I think we kind of already do. I think that we're trying to match what we think it is uh, with what it could be, and I think at a certain point those things those things will meet at a scale at which we can all mostly witness and agree and experience. Mm, I love that. Yeah. It's sort of a, a collective reality as it were. Um, I love that. I love that, man. This, this conversation went in directions I wasn't expecting, man. And I'm so happy it did. Um, Cause oh, I was, okay, I thought we were going to talk about presidents and UFOs for like an hour, but <laughs> this has been such a rewarding conversation for for me as a ufo podcaster so um obviously Sick. i want to thank you for giving me way more time than i anticipated um but lastly man obviously uh can you tease anything you're up to um that you're going to be doing and uh where can everyone find everything you're up to yeah, I mean, I, there's a few things up in the air uh, right now, things being pitched, but I can say that generally, like, one one is my, my book is getting finished, my autobiography, um, and uh, that should be, I don't know, hopefully out within less than a year, um, so you'll hear about it. It's called Great Falls, uh, and, uh, and I have a, a couple music shows that we're going to be pitching, kind of getting back to the roots of just having a show that I'd be hosting, and we'd be, uh, we'd have uh, bands playing live on the show, but up and coming bands. And, um, and then of course the number one rule to playing on the show is that you can have no backing tracks, no computer with a space bar that you hit. It's like, it all has to be played and performed live. Um, yeah. So that, and then also a project that I'm doing with AI, um, uh, um, a show that I'll be, uh, creating, um, that, uh, revolves around, uh, AI and its current insane rapid implementation and evolution interesting oh that's a whole other conversation we could have we'll have to have you come back on sometime man please um i know anytime. you're a busy dude <laughs> well anytime Reggie, man i gotta thank you for um accepting the invitation for coming on a ufo podcast and again this is um a very rewarding conversation for me so thank you for joining me on somewhere in the skies Thanks, Mr. Sprague. Um, and uh, enjoy Scotland. Cheers. Cheers to that, buddy. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll tip back a scotch for you for sure. Please, please. <laughs>